What's up, everybody? Welcome into Tom Cameron's Patriots Talk podcast. Of course, Phil Perry always joining me. And Phil, Patriots make no deals at the deadline. On bigger scale, there is no move for Deshaun Watson. He remains a Houston Texan and will be in mothballs until further notice. Von Miller, of course, we know he made a move to Los Angeles. He's going to play the Rams. Patriots won't see him this year unless they get to the Super Bowl. So I don't even care about the Von Miller deal at this point. What does the Patriots' inactivity on its face tell you about how they feel about their team? Well, I'm not sure it tells us that they didn't try, right? A lot of times Bill Belichick will tell us that, you know, they're always open for deals. And for one reason or another, you don't get a call or you get a call late. And it's, it's sometimes just hard to hammer out trades in the NFL. We know this. One reason why you might want to care a, a little bit, a smidge, about the Von Miller trade is not because he ends up in LA and uh, you know, the Broncos lose a good pass rusher. The Broncos ate a ton of money in trading away Von Miller for the two picks Mm -hmm. they got. And I wonder Tom, if that made them reluctant to eat a lot more money in dealing Kyle Fuller, Kyle Fuller was one of the better corners available on the market. He would have been a guy that I would think had the circumstances been a little bit different. Patriots had a little bit more money. If he costs a little bit less, they might have been interested in. And I'm going to uh, say something. I'm gonna, that was not obvious to me as to a reason I should care about the Von Miller deal. You drilled down pretty significantly there through the upper crust, through the epidermis, down really near the bone to find a reason that I should give a shit. And I'm going to salute you because you brought it back around local. All sports, all politics, everything is local. It's all local. Why baby. does it matter that Von Miller is a Ram? Because the Broncos didn't want to swallow more Kyle Fuller cash. That meant the Patriots couldn't do because they didn't have the room. That's next level stuff, Phil. Yeah, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if that's the case. No, but it, I don't but care it may have if you know. Case. I don't care if you know. It's a great to theory. Out. Patriots to couldn't find do out, it because actually. Von Miller. Well, uh, listen, I would say Patriots probably were limited in any of the trades they could have made because they're pretty tight up against it in terms of their salary cap. Kyle Fuller was one of the more expensive guys who was pretty clearly out there. Like the the Broncos have been looking to trade this guy, but it looks like he wasn't traded today. I think part of that is because he's pretty expensive. He's on a nine and a half or $9 million base salary this year. So you've got to have four and a half ish to be able to take him on unless the Broncos are willing to eat money. But again, they just ate a bag full on Von Miller. So there's um, only so much money you can eat. Right. I mean, I know everybody that. gets full I'm a big eventually. time money eater. Who was the guy who ate the money sandwiches? Was it Stevie Johnson? Remember Stevie Johnson, the receiver? From <laughs> he was the great. Bills? Too. He, was he, he was eating money sandwiches in a music video, I think. Um, to me, the Patriots didn't necessarily need to make a trade. We talked about this last week and we talked about this on Monday. The Patriots should have enough in house to get where we all think thought they might be able to get to in 2021 that's the playoffs so no matter if you have nagging concerns about their ability at the cornerback position I don't think that should hold them hostage same thing with the slot receiver spot same thing with the the tackle spots I mean there's concern there but we haven't seen hiding our hair of Trent Brown in a few weeks so when he returns at whatever size he might be at that time he should help again Sean Wade concussion you can add a player there that you've acquired who can be in the mix. So to me, they have enough. There was not a need to add somebody for the stretch run like you would in major league baseball, because you have a shot at winning the world series or the Patriots used to do annually because they were a super bowl threat. Just stay the course with what you got. You're still a rebuilding team. Aren't they? Aren't they a rebuilding team, Phil? They're rebuilding, but they're trying to win. See, they're right? I mean, I think we all look, they? it's a little different. It's not, you know, this isn't the Eagles, it's not the Jaguars. It's a, this is they want to compete. And I, I would have been doing everything I can to to add a corner. I, I really would have. I just think they're gonna be everything in you can. Not you everything. Have done everything. No, no, I wouldn't have, no, I wouldn't have trade a, a, a third or higher pick. Would I have been willing to trade a fourth if the Broncos ate a bunch of money for Kyle Fuller? I might have been. I I just think that could be what does them in. 
this year is that outside the numbers cornerback spot, it's just too important to not be fully staffed there. And I think Sean Wade could be a good player, but he's such an unknown to me. He's more of a developmental guy at this point, And he's missed so much time with the concussion that I'm not sure you can even really know fully what you have in him. So it's tough though, because Fuller might've been the only one who was truly an outside guy. I don't know. You want to get Vernon Hargraves from the Texans for like a lower round pick. That would have been, that would have been something I would have been interested in. Joe Hayden for a low round pick. He's more of a zone guy, I think, at this point in time. But the Patriots might be a zone defense now mm-hmm. because they're 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 just thin at corner. So I would have been looking to add one more body, but um, like one spot that actually to well, me, Tom, is more but, but, solidified than than I thought was was slot. I just really like Miles. I just Bryant. don't think that no matter who you added here, none of those guys were going to add. Akib Talib level. No. So that's, no. that's, that's, I guess what I. But they're better had, than Jalen Mills is what no I doubt. would argue. But the, the 2012 acquisition of Akib Talib around the trade deadline, that was, that changed really everything for the next two years. It took a team that, yeah, they went to the Super Bowl in 11. They weren't that good a team. Gerard Mayo will tell you that. It turned that 2012 team and it turned the defense in the secondary for most of the next five or six seasons until Matt Patricia got his hands too far in the soup, turned them into a really good secondary. I love doing that to Phil because he just almost giggles every time I mention Matt Patricia. Um, so there was nothing there to be had. So I don't kick rocks over them not doing anything. It's just whatever, whatever. What about Deshaun uh, Watson I won't. staying at I home? Just wanna, I just want to make it clear. I'm not, kick, I'm, not, I'm not kicking rocks. No, no, you're doing what you ought to do. You're saying, you know, they could have done this, could have done that. I don't care or whatever. Um, staff it you got to be staffed staff it here is adam schefter's tweet he works for espn and bruce allen um but here is adam schefter's tweet regarding deshaun watson not being dealt this is what he wrote although the dolphins did due diligence on deshaun watson and had conversations with houston Miami will not make a trade for the quarterback, per source. Dolphins owner Stephen Ross, who had contingencies that needed to be met for any deal, made the final decision to not move forward. Huh. Makes sense to me. I wouldn't have done it either. You're going to deal for the guy he's not going to be able to play because he would immediately be thrown into the, into the cooler. Guarantee you that. So... Why not wait until next spring? Because he this does this year's contract toll? I guess it does because he's he's inactive. He's on the that's roster. A, that's he a just good doesn't question. play. He's on the fifty three though. Yeah, he just doesn't play. So this he's, he's know, getting paid all year. T- he's getting paid right. Yeah, so it doesn't toll right. That means that he's got a year of yeah, his that's contract I mean. that's yeah. gone. Yeah, toll no toll. So uh, my question is, and it every every leak of the. Dolphins interest in Deshaun Watson could have been coming from somewhere else, right? Could have been coming from Houston, could have been coming. But if they were never going to do this, unless the legal stuff was cleared, why was there so much heat? Why was it? This is a matter of time. Is that that's at least what it felt like, you know, Miami or bust was a report I heard, you know? So like, I guess, you know, we ended up getting nothing. So that is still accurate, but wasn't wasn't this in some way the Dolphins doing the fact that we expected this to happen to a certain degree? Well, I wonder if it's the it's Houston's doing. This is uh, what <clears throat> Mike Florio wrote earlier today. Um, permission was granted Monday night to the Miami Dolphins to speak with Deshaun Watson. Two sides were close to a deal last week. Then the Texans caught wind of a potential settlement of the 22 civil lawsuits pending against Watson, and they drove up the price. Talks cratered. The two sides never reached a deal. So that they got to the point where they were allowing Miami to speak to Deshaun Watson and at least spitball on how his acquisition would look and what he might be doing with the complainants indicates that they were down the road and maybe Houston once they caught wind of that said well if he's going to plead to stuff and that might get him into the NFL quicker as opposed to on double secret probation 
if you're going to be using them this year, we want to get compensation that indicates that. So I don't know. I mean, it's it's just it's one of the most screwed up situations that I can recall in really the is. NFL. And because it's such a minefield to talk about, because the amount of effort expended by the NFL on the flake gate or spy gate relative to getting to the bottom of the Deshaun Watson situation or being transparent on the Washington football team situation is embarrassing. You know, really when you pull back the, <laughs> the blanket on it and look at just the number of grotesque inconsistencies where football air is involved as opposed to human beings and the way they have comported themselves on both fronts. I can see why we end up just saying, oh, well, the fourth best quarterback in the NFL is not playing because A, he started a holdout and then B, during his holdout, we had 25 people come forward to say that he was engaging in improprieties during massages to again, tiptoe around the minefield of what actually appears to have been going on. Anyway, he's going to be a Houston Texan. He's going to sit there on ice. And one of the most absurd stories in the NFL continues. Yeah, and they'll, they'll still be able to trade him this offseason. <clears throat> I would think get a fair amount for him. And if you're looking to trade him to Miami, I don't know. I mean, if does he trading him host... later get you a better – does it, does it get you better compensation trading only later? If, only if he hooks you up and, and resolves his issues. I mean, that's the interesting thing. He can make himself more attractive to be dealt by right. doing whatever he needs to do or maybe doing the right thing. Hey, who would have thought of that? Right, exactly. Um, but he can make himself more employable by doing that. But in making himself more employable, his current employers – who he has basically turned his back on, no matter how much revulsion the Houston Texans cause you as a fan, no matter how cringy Jack Easterby is as a guy or Cal McNair, there's still an employer who entered into a contract with this guy who just said, nope, not going to do it. And when you thought that Deshaun Watson might have been standing on principle and doing that, turns out he might not be that great a guy either. So... I mean, the whole thing is, who do you root for in that situation? Nobody. Can't. Nobody. Can't do it. Can't have Can't it. it. Before we push away from the table on Deshaun Watson, let's talk briefly about the Miami Dolphins situation in general. They have the sixth overall pick. Fifth? Tua. Was he five or six? He was five. Herbert was six. Five. So they have the fifth overall pick from a year ago. He's already being... Show them the door. They've won one game. They are seemingly dysfunctional. And they've gone from a 10 and 6 team to one that, that could be a three win, three and 13, three and 14 team. It's staggering. And where do the Dolphins go from here? Do you say, okay, two, we're, we're only kidding? Do they look for a quarterback in next year's draft with yet another? top five pick or do they just reconvene on Deshaun Watson and will Brian Flores be around to watch it unfold? Answer me, Phil. Give me that the I don't know. I, what they should have done with this whole Deshaun Watson thing is not show their hand. And I don't know how you do that. Maybe there've just been too many talks between their front office and Houston's for it not to be, be known by so many people that it eventually has to get out. But you have not just cratered Tua's confidence, I, was, I assume, mm -hmm. but you've also probably cratered the team's confidence level in Tua. You're, right. you're out there. <clears throat> the owner's meeting with the guy. There's reports for months that you want a new quarterback. So should it be any surprise to us that this team – is watching that unfold and saying, well, this guy's not really good anyway, and we don't even really want him. So what are we doing out here? And, and they're just falling apart at the seams. They're not a veteran enough team to be able to handle that kind of thing. It's just, it's a, it's an awful, awful situation to put yourselves in. I think it, it has to have had some sort of emotional psychological impact on not just the quarterback, 
but the entire group because their <laughs> their total dissolution into being unable to to function. I mean, they haven't won since the opener. Is remarkable. Since the opener. It's insane. They haven't won since they beat the Patriots by one point, thanks to a bunch of fumbles. They could be winless. They could be staring the frigging Lions straight in the face if it wasn't for Damian Harris's fumble. And they shouldn't be a winless team. But they. But that's where they – so how do you explain it? They traded away Kyle Van Noy, Quick Slant's (laughs) co-host, who you'll hear from at the back end of this podcast. Kyle Van Noy was the key to the Miami Dolphins. I, I do wonder too, Tom, and you know, I think we both had good relationships mm. with a lot of those guys that went down to Miami. But at some point, there's been so many moves there made. Our players looking at them and saying, do we, "What's going on? We're on like our seventh offensive coordinator in the last three years." Van Noy's gone. Two is being shoved out the door. We're giving a lot of money to cornerbacks, and you know, we're not really sure. You know, we're we're investing in these offensive linemen that stink. You know, like what's going on? Do we like, how do we make this, how do we make this work? And I I just, to me, it has to be more than just on the field talent because they're better than a one win football team. Phil, when we look at the landscape in the AFC right now, there are two divisions, which are entirely 500 or better AFC West, AFC North. Then there's one good team in the NFC South and there's two decent teams in the AFC East. Really, it's an 11-team race right now. Just for argument's sake, I am eliminating the Indianapolis Colts from the conversation. I just don't think they're very good. I don't think they're going to playoffs. They're three and five. They're two and three in the conference, while the Patriots are four and one. So the Patriots are just, you know, one game better, but to be taken seriously. I don't, I'm not scared of any of these friggin' teams from the Patriots. Tennessee without Derrick Henry. The Raiders with a tragic situation to deal with is Henry Ruggs um, is involved in a fatal car accident and is going to be charged with DUI and um, vehicular man homicide. Baltimore Ravens, savvy team. Buffalo, good. So I'd say Baltimore and Buffalo is what you, you have stated. And Kansas City at four and four. Those would be the three teams I would put at the top of the conference. Then you have Cincy. Pittsburgh, LA, New England, and Cleveland. Throw Denver in if you want. You know what? Denver can screw. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> You're in. You're out. So That's we're it. down to 10 teams. And the only tier of teams I would say, shit, man, those are they're good. Is Buffalo. Then Baltimore. I would put Buffalo. I would put Buffalo in its own tier. Okay. And then I probably would put Baltimore in its own tier. And then I think Tennessee Tennessee has to lead the next tier. Tennessee, Vegas, New England. Vegas is going. Vegas is going. Cleveland, Kansas City. All of those teams need to be in a in a in a big ball of goo somewhere. But the Patriots should be in the same goo. No, I would put Kansas City ahead of the. I would put Kansas City ahead of Vegas. They're scary, man. They've been. I don't understand how he looks they've performed ridiculously the way they have. bad. I think it's. Like, I think it's late enough into the season to say they're just they're they're not that good this year. He is. I think it is. Let's let's get on Patrick Mahomes for ninety seconds. Oh my God, he's rolling into trouble. He's increasing the de- degree of difficulty on his throws. They. <laughs> They had one competent drive where they said, okay, let's hand it off for a few minutes. And they let, I watched Joe Tooney the entire drive. He was an A minus the whole time. They cleared hole after hole and marched down the field and scored a touchdown. And then they got back to the same, hey, let's, you know, wander around the playground and see what we can flip. Hey, watch this. I'm going to fire it out of my armpit. Oh, wow. And didn't land it on somebody's shins? Well, get them next time. I mean, the rolling to the right and throwing it into the cheerleaders, I can't watch it anymore. I mean, it was adorable for a while, but it's no fun anymore. Well, it's no fun because he's the not worst working, quarterback in the right? NFL. <laughs> no, far from it. Far mm-hmm. from it. Far from it. And I think the offense is still going to end up being very good. I mean, you look at some of their numbers, and last night is not a great indication of, of how good they they can be and have been. 
Uh, but they move the ball as, as well as any offense in football, as, as well as a lot of offenses over the course of the last decade. But it feels like they turn it over too much. It doesn't feel like it. We, we know that. They turn it over too much in some of these games and end up keeping it closer than it should be or losing. And to me, I mean, what the Giants did was I think what a lot of teams are trying to do, um, which is, okay, we'll give up the yards. We'll give up the yards. We'll give up the yards. But once you get into the red zone, the field condenses. You don't have as much space. You use all that speed that you have. Mm -hmm. And we'll figure it out occasionally. Not every time, but occasionally. They're 19th right now um, from the numbers I'm looking at. They're 19th in the league in red zone percentage success Mm. rate. So they shouldn't be there. They're too talented to be there. I think that'll get a little bit better. But Tom, their defense is like historically bad. I mean, it's been it's been god awful. And so I think you combine those two factors, inconsistency offensively and just the just the total ineptitude on the defensive side. And they can't be with those other two teams to me. It's still Buffalo, Baltimore. I agree. And the rest. I agree. But I, I, I put them behind Tennessee, but right with Tennessee. And I put them ahead of Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and the Raiders. And I put the Patriots with Cincinnati and Pittsburgh and the Raiders and the Clevelands. So that's the skinny on the American football conference, which has four, two win team, two loss teams and uh, three, three and even, loss teams. Even Baltimore, Tom, just I know. because I was looking at some of what they had done prior to the Patriots chargers game, because they were the last team to play the chargers. Their defense is not great this year. Okay. They're one of the worst teams in football in terms of yards allowed per game passing wise. Uh, they've had some injuries. So they're not what they usually are on that side. Lamar Jackson has been really good. Special teams will always be good with John Harbaugh. And so I still, I think they're a good team, but they're not like the same Baltimore that, that we're used to seeing. They gamble a ton defensively and they get away with it. Sometimes they don't others. I know you won't take offense at this every once in a while while you're talking, I'm listening, but I'll cruise over to my uh, Twitter feed. Mm-hmm. And one man throw ride just tweeted that Tom Brady won four rings after he was my age. He'd be the goat if his career started at 36. Imagine that. Imagine that. Phil, anything else from the trade deadline pod that we need to hit? We can I do the Carolina a, stuff. I love, that, I love that we got the one-man throw right in. It's been a while since we've had really mentioned on the pod. Thrilly dilly. Uh, no, nothing Nothing to add. I just feel like it's, it's a dud this year. I, th- I do think it's in part across the league, Tom, because just big picture, not a lot of trades, not a lot of movement. The cap space situation thing is a thing for like a lot of teams this year. When Mm -hmm. the cap craters the way it does, it's hard to add payroll. And so I think that's one of the reasons why it was uh, pretty uneventful this year. Plus with teams losing money last year relative to how they normally do and Stan Kroenke running up a massive bill in St. Louis that all the owners have to cobble together and throw money up to. I wonder if that's interesting to talk about. Maybe we should hit that on the Pat's Talk Pod next week. Go a little bigger picture, see if I can get some uh, some of the national guys because I do find that interesting because it does impact the Patriots and Robert Kraft fairly significantly too. So well, let's bat that around. Meanwhile, folks, why don't you bat around the next eight to nine minutes of Kyle Van Noy, who is pretty interesting. Wait till you hear what he has to say about Stephon Gilmore. Justin Herbert, after Sunday, he is 0 and 2 and has floundered two touchdowns, four picks, worst against any opponent. And we bring in one of the guys who was the architect of Justin Herbert's no good, very bad, unimpressive day. It's Kyle Van Noy. The architect? I well, pushing it, but I was Okay, you I was were, you were, there. You were driving in, nails. Yeah, yeah, you there we go. You weren't the architect, you were, you yeah. were the builder. Yes, I had, I had the, the electrical screwdriver, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. How'd you guys do it? You know, he, he talked about not to get two X's and O's, but let's do it. You guys are football fans. You can talk football and listen to football. He said that you guys played more cover two, which is two safeties at the back and kind of taking away those explosive downfield receivers. Yeah, I think anytime you can um, confuse a quarterback just a little bit, I think that helps out a lot. And I think we were able to do that uh, mix uh, band calls with uh, zone calls. We, the coaches had a great plan and we executed uh, the the way that Patriot football is all about, uh, and yeah. All right, so you got a guy like me who's out here saying, well, you know, what this defense is missing is a soup-to-nuts performance. 
We've seen good performances against Tampa Bay, but not the finish. We've seen an excellent second half performance against Houston. We've seen what wasn't a great performance in critical times against Dallas. This, though, this felt like the day when the defense was what I think Bill Belichick and you guys all thought the defense would be. It's not permanent, I know, but. But see, we also, you know, being who I am, critical of myself, my mm -hmm. own play as well as um, the defense because I have ownership in that. We, we let, you know, them have a couple too many big plays. Mm -hmm. We had the long run by Jackson, no-no. Same with Eckler, that was a no-no. And then the long pass at the end of the game with Mills, um, it was a good play, but, you know, Mills knows uh, and AP know they got to make that play, which is, and we got to do a better job at rushing the passer on that and getting Herber off the spot. So we take, we all take ownership um, in all of those plays. All 11 of us on those big plays all could have played better. One thing that I do want you to take a victory lap on, though, is the complimentary football. Look, you, the offense is down there. They're on the one yard line. They don't get in. Mm hmm you guys do get the three and out. You force them to punt from inside their 10. 22-yard return by Olszewski. You don't score. Mm -hmm. You get it back for them again. You only get three. You pick them off and get it back for them again. They get another three. That, to me, was the kind of thing that really blows a lot of air up the skirt of Bill Belichick. <laughs> the skirt? I don't know about that. Well, be that as it may. <laughs> I'm not going to say it, that. <laughs> I think it would enthuse just about anybody who likes that complimentary football. Yeah, I think when your defense is clicking like that and give, you know, our job is to give the offense as many times as they can to crack the code, and eventually they got it done. And that's what it's all about is all three phases playing together as one unit, and I think we did a good job of that. It's exciting to get a mm. dub, especially all the way across the country against another opponent coming off a of bye week, which that's also another key point. Um, and now our focus is now on the Panthers. You know, they we're excited for this challenge. We're excited to see our guy Steph, uh, and we're we're excited to go visit their home. And you know, we're road warriors right now. And we got to continue that. Should the Patriots have done a better job of keeping Steph Gilmore on the roster? You know, that's, that's out of my hands. <laughs> that's out of my hands. I, I wish nothing but the best for him. Mm -hmm. I saw, you, you know, as soon as the game ended, obviously you look at the scores and you check up on your guy and he's like, dang, he already had a pick. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I know. It just shows the type of play. You know, I, that doesn't surprise me. That's the type of player he is. And, you know, I'll love to Steph. You talked about going cross country. It seems as if a lot of your fans either went cross country to be in that stadium yeah. or they were already there. Were you surprised? Yes, I was. I, you know, our fans travel really well, so I wasn't surprised in that regards, but I was surprised of how loud it was. It felt almost like a home game. Uh, I think people enjoy the California weather and mm -hmm. the sights, um, just like I do. That's why I live there. <laughs> um, but it, it was fun to play personally for me in front of some family and some friends. Um, I had quite a bit of people come. So I know they were, they were rooting loud for the p Pats and it was just awesome to be in an environment like that to see the support Patriots Nation. It, it runs deep and it's, a, it's amazing and it's an honor to play in front of fans that are so passionate and bring the noise even on the road. See, that's one thing that about, look, Miami fans are passionate, South Florida fans are passionate. <laughs> I say that kind of knowing that they're really not. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, were, they were good to me. I can't complain. They, they embraced me down there, so I, I, can't, I can't agree with you on okay, that Okay, fair. They, they loved me, and but I loved them. But they're different here. For sure. I mean, the expectations are higher. Do the expectations of Patriots fans, as we watch this season unfold, and all the times you said there's no such thing as a moral victory, and I said there is, and all those moral victories helped you win the other day, be that as it may. <laughs> The expectation level of the fans, does it ever bear anything at all in your minds? I know your coach is going to be the first and foremost, and then you, and then your teammates, but do the fans' expectations ever enter into it? No, because I think our expectations are higher. You know, I mean, personally, for mm -hmm. me, that's what my expectations are to make every play, you know, to play every snap, to make every play, and um, I just try to do my, my part and do my best. And... Uh, my expectations, I know when I mess up and, you know, when I do make a play, it's like you worked hard for that. So that's kind of what everybody's expectation is around the building, saying, you know, you're just trying to do your job at the highest level and you know that 
standard. It was set before I even got mm -hmm. there. It's been set for a long time, and whoever comes in that building knows that standard. You talk about expectations. What were your expectations the first time you saw Christian Barmore? <laughs> Be more. Um, as far as, like, the player? The build and the resume that he came with, because he was one of the most explosive defensive linemen in college last year, even though he lasted until the second round. Yeah, b -more is a problem. And I mean that a problem in a good way. Mm -hmm. A problem for offenses, um, offensive coordinators, that's for sure. What he is able to do at his size and strength and speed is uh, pretty amazing. I'm, I'm excited for him as he continues to get better each and every week and he, and he continues to learn, you know, this isn't college, this, you know, just getting better and his willing to come with that attitude each and every week is impressive. Can you describe what it is about his game, physically, mentally, whatever, that's different from guys you've played in in the past? As far as like being rookies or watching, like, just watching him and saying, that doesn't seem normal <laughs> <laughs> because he's doing some things at the age of 21 yeah. or whatever he is that he's ruining plays. Yeah, he's doing a really good job of being disruptive. You know, we all. Is it the speed? It's both. It being that big and fast, is, you, you don't find a lot of humans like that. No. So being able to do that and then also take the coaching and the technique and trying to master that is really what's going to separate him. And he just got to keep working, be more as a. He's a good kid. He's That's funny, good. too. He's is funny, he? yeah. Got to get him on Elite I was going to say, yeah, he'd be a that, prime candidate he, he for Elite is. Eats. He is, yes. Elite Eats, of course, is, is <laughs> Kyle's side job. Always plugging that in. I, I don't blame it. you because it's Thank funny. You. gives an opportunity to, to, to restaurants locally to have their names get out there and have teammates and himself get out there. And you can check it out. You'll like it. Elite yeah. Eats. You can find that on YouTube. It's Eats with a Z. Last question. You laughed at me when I said moral victories. Oh, there's no moral victories around here. Yeah. You know what? Those narrow losses mm. to Tampa and Dallas, even though there were little blemishes in there that caught, sometimes big blemishes, that caused them to be L's, I think those do help in that they actually affirm that you guys have the capability to be a really good team. Yeah. And I think this week can prove that. So you just tell you, all you have to do is nod and say, you're right, Tom. They're not right. Tom. Moral victories. Moral victories. They are now five and two in the moral victory column. <laughs>